Welcome to the Poisoner's Cabinet. I'm Sinead. And I'm Nick. And this is your weekly podcast exploring the lives of the great poisoners, macabre murders and captivating crimes from across the centuries and creating curious cocktails inspired by the desert we tell. And it's episode 155. And Yay. Nick. <laughs> as, uh, yeah, as people might notice, sounding slightly different at the moment. It's, it, <laughs> and it is, it is actually me. <laughs> <laughs> it's not some other weird person. It's actually me. Um, but yeah, I'm a bit poorly. Nick has been poorly this week. Oh, no. <laughs> so, sounding very strange. And it's been a hilarious day. I'm glad you're finding it amusing. Yes, because we've been working together earlier. When I, when I started the day and I saw you first, you were all up here like I this. I know, it changes <laughs> by the minute. So the octaves are all over the place. And sometimes it just goes all together halfway through a sentence. <laughs> So. Now it's gone deep. It's quite. It's quite sexy. It's, it's gone quite deep now. All right, you need to say something sensual. Nothing too sensual, obviously. <laughs> Just keep it PG thirteen. No, maybe. I, I don't believe so. Just say smelly cat. No, smelly. I'm not, no. <laughs> you're gonna get a load of DMs now. Fran, Fran, huh? can you hear Fran. me, Fran? <laughs> what does he say? Do you want me to come, Fran? <laughs> I can come, Fran. <laughs> <I'm> Fran. <laughs> Oh, actually, you should say at last the at last we shall have our vengeance. At last the Jedi will pay. <laughs> <laughs> no. No. Okay. No. no. You're not taking I the quest, not, are no, you? Absolutely not. Or well, I'm Maximus Decimus Meridius. <laughs> <laughs> well, let's get a couple of cocktails down you, and we'll see. We'll see what happens. Poor Nick has been poorly all week. Um, had to, couldn't couldn't even do Patreon. You were very very sick. Thank this you, week. thank you very much to Tim who stood in. It's going to be a fun episode. Well, I'd say how are you, but I think it's pretty damn. I, I think we know what the answer to that is. <laughs> You're drugged up. Yeah, well, lots and lots of drugs. Lots uh, of drugs. I made you a big honey and lemon drink that you did not like. Yeah, well, it was very lemony. But now there's booze. Oh uh, yeah, I've decided I'm going to terrify the germs with the Negroni. Medicinal Negroni. Absolutely. Extra Campari. But yeah, burn the buggers out. Any poisonings this yeah, week? Yeah, me apparently. Yeah, apparently they yeah. got to you. Yeah. yeah, they got me. All my talk over 150 episodes of <laughs> how I've, I've, I've been off scot-free. <laughs> the sarin attacks have yeah, they, finally they, landed. Yeah, they've, um, they found me. And don't worry, because it's my episode this week. If it was your episode, that would be cruel. Then we would be in trouble, I feel. Could turn into a scintillating story well, if you were just gravelly voice talking. <laughs> And ever about murder, and everyone's like, "This is sort of like hit a new peak." We had never had more downloads. Yeah, but then the week after, we're like, "Ah, oh, that's boring. It's back to normal." <laughs> yeah, exactly. A lot of people tuned in, yeah. and then we're like, "We were promised sexy yeah, voices." Like, oh, we're disappointed now. <laughs> Doesn't sound like that in real life. Well, speaking of gravelly, sexy voices that could kill you, and Negronis, I think it is time for us to thank our delicious Patreon subscribers. Thank you very much to Cece Crocker, to Rach. To Trish Megissi and to Jason Brega. Thank you so much, lovely Patreon subscribers. As I said, we had fun this week with Tim Cloak, who gave us a little history lesson ahead of the coronation. I know, coronation on Saturday. Coronation in the UK this weekend. However you feel about it, it's happening. It's happening, the old King Charlie. Yeah, people are already queuing up. Yesterday, already queuing. they'd already started queuing. They're camping <sighs> down the mile. So, there Which we I go. I shall be doing that. No, 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 we shan't. We shall observe it and, and have our views on it. Tim did take us on a journey all the way back to the time of William the Conqueror and a fun tale of the succession of him and his sons. It was very, very good. It was an good. interesting time, I believe. Yeah, it's that we can always trust Tim to pull out the history. Big guns. Uh, and I just sit there and nod. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> I agree entirely. He was making an analogy about the current royal family when he started describing the royals of the time, and I just did not get it. <laughs> he was saying, oh, yes, two princes, one with red hair, a line of succession. I'm like, oh, is it the Plantagenets? Is it? Oh, wait, hang on a minute. Yeah. Terrible with my kings yeah, and queens. it's not going well, is it? I barely know which one is. it is now. Right. I keep calling him Charles II. It's not Charles II. It's not. It's not. It's not Charles II. And Zeg. then I go, when did he... He had a much him? bigger wig. He did. <laughs> and then his head fell off. No, that was Charles I. That was the first. Yeah, that was the oh, first. Oh, no, no, He just exploded a bit. Yeah, yeah. He was. He had a terrible death, Charles II. Anyway, enough of kings and queens and such frivolity. Nick. Hello. Are you ready? <laughs> yeah, yes, let's go for it. To drink cocktails and talk about poison, or <laughs> we could drink poison and talk about cocktails. I've already drunk the poison. <laughs> I've already had a big bowl of poison. <laughs> no need more of that. My voice can't get any weirder. 
Well, let's soothe it with alcohol. Let's do that. Go yes. with the first let's one. Let's go with the first one. Let's go with the first one. Hooray, hooray, hooray. It is my story, thank God, this week. And we can't, we can't, we can't possibly have a story without a cocktail in hand. As you know, dear listeners, every week we choose a secret ingredient that is inspired by the tale that we tell and it will flavor our cocktail of the week. And this week's secret ingredient is... Raspberries. raspberries finally how have I we know. not done this I, 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 you messaged that i had to go through the list of all the things we've done over yeah. 100 i thought no we've not done raspberries strawberries and peaches and apples and oranges and bananas and but not the but humble not raspberry not the, and the blueberries and i was very happy when i found this when i was researching this episode found one reference and i thought oh this is going to be tenuous turns out it's a big part of it Excellent. it's fine glad, but yes glad. raspberries galore Hurrah. so with raspberries as your ingredient yes. or inspiration it's- I don't Inspiration. Know. What have you come up with? Well, I thought there are, there are plenty of really, really fruity things. I'm not a huge fan of a really, really fruity, sweet, fruity drink. No. I, I find I prefer something with more oomph. Okay. <laughs> I'm sorry, I can't take you serious. <laughs> I prefer something with some oomph behind it. <laughs> like everyone's fanning themselves right now, Nick. <laughs> but yes, oomphy drinks. Oomphy, oomph. I like an oomphy drink. So I found something, oomph and raspberries. Yay. We are having, I don't know if this is said... As the initials, I-V-O, or it's an I-V-O. I-V-O. It's I-V-O, but it's all in capitals. Oh, well, I think if it's in capitals, I guess it's an I-V-O. And that's what that's what I was thinking. Ooh, does I-V-O stand for anything? Does anyone know any abbreviations for that? Well, or? apparently, this this is actually one that was made by Simon Different. Apparently, the, the name comes from the logo of... There's a club in London called Quo Vardis. Ooh, okay. Um, and th- and this is where it was made in the bar of Quo Vardis, and this is where it comes from. What would that be? Would that be anything in Roman numerals? Oh, we'll, we'll look it up. Um, in so the we'll break. look it up. But anyway, we're having an IVO um, <laughs> as 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 the cocktail, and people can tell us where it comes from or why, or if there's a zero in the, I know in the Roman numerals. I think there is, but we'll look it up. We shouldn't speculate anymore. We, we sound like idiots right now. <laughs> I'm excited. If it is a Simon Difford recipe, we are onto a good thing, surely, and it will surely cure Nick of all his ailments. That's the plan. Well, I think it is high time for us to crawl into the poisonous cabinet kitchen and shake up a storm, so we'll see you in a minute. We'll see you in a bit. And we're back. Hello. Ooh, it's gone deeper. I it like has, it. Yeah. <laughs> we have our drinks, our Ivo. We're not able to decipher the Roman numerals. Oh, no, no. The very quick bit of Googling I did and it said, it's four and then nothing. And then nothing. And then O. And, and yeah, you'd think it would be easier for me to work out what O is in Roman numerals. But no, no, no. no. Apparently not. But Ivy O. It looks very brown. Brown. We enjoy a brown drink. The brown. I've got the brown Kill me or cure me. (laughs) It looks very fancy. Uh, I think this probably will cure you because it looks like it's going to be a spirit forward one. Lovely. Okay, let's have a snifter. Oh, it smells good. It smells nice. Smells of raspberries. There's always a bonus. (laughs) Yay. Okay. Cheers. Let's dive in. Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas. Ooh. Oh, that's got a bit of a fruity twang. That has got a fruity twang. It's not as spirit forward as I thought. No, me neither. It's no. actually a bit more subtle. That is thought. very subtle. That's good. I that's, like that. You know what I described it as? Elegant. Elegant. Oh, okay. Yeah. <laughs> oh, oh, I broke your voice. Oh. Elegant, and it's an elegant drink. That's nice, I like that. Mm. All right, so guessing of the, now, if it's a Diffords, it's not going to have much in it. A fair, a fair guess. Fair guess. Okay, uh, bourbon mainly because I saw you pour me some bourbon. Uh, I'm not yes, going to lie. Yeah, you, you <laughs> snuck in on that one. I'm sorry. Raspberry Chambord. Chambord is the way forward. Oh, we love Chambord, the holy hand grenade. But then there's something else. Oh, there's something else. There's some, there, there are, there are two, <laughs> it's not there, just those. There are two something else. Oh, there's two something else's. Oh, I don't know. It's really subtle. So something's cancelled out, that harsh bourbon-y fruitiness. Uh, has it got any more fruity shit in it? No, not explicitly fruity. Not explicitly. On the weekends, it's fruity. <laughs> the rest of the week, it's straight-laced all the <laughs> way down the middle. Oh, God, I don't, I don't know what that is. Now all I'm thinking is bananas. And it's like, what? No, that, it's a I, seed. I, I feel bananas will be explicitly fruity. <laughs> uh, something nutty that's also a fruit. Is it tomato? Yes. I'm not going to guess anymore. Uh, I'm going to let you explain it because you seem like you're in the mood to talk more. <laughs> <laughs> we have sweet vermouth. Oh, okay. Which is made of grapes. So it's made of grapes. It's made of fruit. Oh, I like the way what you did there. And yeah. then we have dry vermouth. So we Ooh. have two varieties of vermouth. Ah, 
not. I guess it does have a waney taste. It does, to yeah, it. absolutely. And you can actually, there's equal quantities of both of them. You you can taste the dry. Oh yeah, and more. Uh, it's beginning and then the dash of bitters as well. Actually, so five five things. Five things. If you want to get technical, it's um it's beginning to kick in as well. Yeah, that's got an aftertaste. I mean, it's uh, not it's a nice aftertaste, but it's got a burny sensation down the throat. Uh, I, maybe, I, can't, I can't feel that. You can't feel. <laughs> <laughs> that's the point is that can you actually taste this it's, it is very subtle and it's I, elegant I, what I taste probably could be entirely different to what you're tasting <laughs> you're so. mainly tasting strepsils right now <laughs> that's a very nice drink what if, for what I can taste I like that you're, you're setting yourself up for it to be really punchy and red hook like uh, and bourbon like um, once you get past that it's got a, it's got a delicacy to it yeah, I, I, think, I think the driver move takes that because yeah. that hint off because even something like a red hook where you've got bourbon and a fruit liqueur like the maraschino the sweet vermouth that has still got much more of a punch to it than mm. this does. I think the dry vermouth really does take the edge off the whole, the whole thing. <laughs> well, it's delicious. You know what, Nick? Your work is done for the week. Hurrah. <laughs> You've got your cocktail. It's an absolute resounding success, the Ivo. Would you like a story? I think that's probably about time. In yeah. which I do all the talking. Excellent. Sounds great. <laughs> so, you're actually in luck this week because sometimes I write a story and go, oh, this will be fun for a lot of banter between the two of us. I'm, I'm good. I'm glad with it's not happening. Uh, it's, it's not. Feel free to jump in. I'll try. Ever. We do want your wit and your humour and your thoughts in it, but I did go down a rabbit hole with this. Now, I'm going to play you some music, Nick, oh. because this is a story that has inspired one of the most famous tales to come to the screen. Okay. And let's I'm not going to recognise it at all, am I? <laughs> Oh, yeah, okay. Twin Peaks, isn't it? Twin Peaks? Yeah. <laughs> I knew that. So Twin Peaks, the TV series, was inspired by a particular murder case. I, I didn't know that, yes. Yes. The inspiration for Twin Peaks is a combination of David Lynch's mind yes. and also Mark Frost, who also co- who co-wrote and co-created... The second series was just stupid. The second series of, of Twin Peaks, no. Like that. First one, absolutely adored it. Watched it when it first came out. Remember watching the first episode with my mum. I remember my parents talking about it. I didn't watch it then. I still remember the opening scenes of it, just going, whoa. And it was the famously Twin Peaks was never supposed to actually reveal who killed mm. Laura Palmer. So Twin Peaks, for those who don't know, follows the story of the murder of the homecoming queen called Laura Palmer in the town of Twin Peaks. And the story as it unravels her seemingly perfect life, actually the town is filled with very shady characters, very strange going on, and Laura was not who she seemed. This story, you can see all of the Twin Peak elements to it because it involves the 1908 murder of a young woman named Hazel Drew. In upstate New York, a tale of a pretty young woman whose death revealed a darkness amongst all the people around her. Nice. (laughs) Who doesn't look dark? Luckily, now I can just rabbit it at you. (laughs) So it's mostly going to be me this week, people. So Hazel Drew was born in 1888, raised in Sand Lake, which is in New York. And she was raised on the family farm. Now, Sand Lake is a few miles away from the then very bustling city of Troy. Do you know of Troy? Uh, only the Greek one. No, it's not that one. Not that one. Not that one as far as they didn't just... Troy wasn't in America as far as we yeah, know. Yeah, and also so it was a lot less bustling at that point. Troy in New York is now just outside of Albany. And this was a bustling area, but Sand Lake, it's a resort town, certainly, where you've got a lot of wealthy New Yorkers coming for the summer, enjoying themselves. But while there are wealthy people frequenting the area, Hazel's family are not amongst them. They are farmers. They are living on a plot of land, working the farm. Her parents and her uncle, William Taylor, work the farm. He actually owns the land, the uncle. They are not part of this elite that come to New York. Hazel is growing up. She has a brother. I don't know if she's got any other sisters, but she's seeing the toil and the hardship of her family, but also seeing all of these fine people coming in and out of the town. And this is very much a time of class divide. Yes. You're getting the Gilded Age coming into its fore and you've got really opulent people who think that they, the world is their oyster and then the people who are left behind. Who are meant to work for them. And the family dynamic of the Drew family with William Taylor, it's a bit weird. Okay. It's not great. There's no one specific event or incident that any of the researchers or any of the people they knew them and passed down through the centuries can pinpoint. But the father and the uncle do not get on. There has been a disagreement between them 
and they're still living and working on the farm and tending to it, but it's just grumpiness and anger and resentment all round. Fun. That's Which great. is not, not, not fun, not fun. Her uncle is famously known to be morose, to be bad-tempered, unsociable. I'm not saying he's you, but... <laughs> I, I'm not bad-tempered. No, you're quite sociable, though. Uh, yeah. <laughs> you can be grumpy, though. Yes. <laughs> Her father, John, is also not a warm father figure, not a particularly devoted husband. He is, again, just working hard as a farmer, tending the land, getting drunk when he's not working. Yeah, just not really present or interested in Hazel at all. Well, she's a girl. She's a girl. She's a girl. What good is she? By the time Hazel hits her teenage years, the urbanisation and the glory of the Gilded Age is really gathering a pace. And Troy, which is but a few miles away, is one of the wealthiest cities in America. It sits on the Hudson and the Mohawk Rivers, and it's a key transportation hub. This is a time transportation. Yay! Boats. Ooh, they've got a train. Boats and the steamships. And the things. steamships. Paddle boats. Can't even now. Horses. The old horse and carriage, that's really taking off. I mean, that's been around for a while. It's been around for a while. Yeah. <laughs> it was one resource I found that really made a lot of that. And it was like, you know, horses have been around for quite a bit. Yeah, absolutely. And the wheel, famously. But, you know, oh no, Troy, they invented it. <laughs> That and their wooden horses. We invented horses. <laughs> uh, lots of mills as well in operation. Lots of logging mills. Mm, Twin Peaks. Mm. Yeah. Um, lot, lot of commerce and massively wealthy families there doing very, very well for themselves. So sort of place that a young girl would visit and her jaw would hit the floor. Like, wow. Having worked on a rural farm, this is a life that... It's going to be amazing. Yeah. I'd like to have. And of course, you've got a lot of women and massive demand for female workers in this town as well. I mean, a woman can get a job in any sort of, you know, whether it's really, really basic work or it's quite well, well paid, decent, decent wage. She's not going to be upper class. It's also a time where women are getting a bit more power. Suffrage is starting. So yeah, why would she stay out in the old family farm? Mm -mm. In 1902, aged just 14, Hazel leaves the farm. Out she goes to become a domestic servant in Troy. You can imagine for her how incredible it would be to suddenly be in the heart of this bustling metropolis. And she wasn't phased by it at all. Not daunted, she was going to get a job with a respectable family and she was going to be part of this world, enjoy every moment of her new life. Hazel, by now, is a very pretty young woman. Blonde haired, blue eyed. I mean, I relate. <laughs> Very bright. Um, ambitious as a servant as well. She, as I said, she didn't want to work for just anyone. And, and she's really incredibly lucky because the first job she gets is for a fairly prominent family where she is working as a domestic servant and will later become a governess. And within these families, she's going to learn how to dress like a proper lady, how to present herself. She's still a servant, but she's not going to be scrubbing toilets. She just wants to enjoy her life. And how she gets these jobs is a mystery. <laughs> The first okay. family she works for, Thomas Hislop, he is a very rich man, prominent public servant. Apparently, he's a family friend. Okay. Mm. Probably not. But she gets the job. She is domestic servant there. After the Hislop, she goes to work for John Tupper, who was a mayoral candidate. So again, very, very wealthy. By the time she's 20 in 1908, she is working for the very wealthy Professor Carey as a governess and as a domestic. And she's living her best life. She is socialising. She's able to attend soirees. She's wearing beautiful clothes. She has good friends. She can take trips. She, her aunt Minnie also lives in Troy and they're very, very close and they go out together. She is able to really enjoy her life. Everyone who knows her says she's lovely, she's charming, not a bad word against her. No boyfriends, not really seeing anyone, not interested in that sort of thing. Just busy having a jolly time. Exactly. She's being a young woman who wants to just wear lovely clothes and, and have a nice time. Her last employer would say Hazel was a good church-going girl who loved to read. Mm -hmm. Delightful. Everything is lovely, Nick. Everything is so lovely. I think there's a bot coming soon. Until July 1908. You should really say that I bit. Know, I should have said that. I don't know. Yeah, I don't know with the new voice now. With the new up. The, the, new, the new. It's strangled by fear, yeah. clearly. Terror. The tension of That's the story. <laughs> yes, July 1908. Things are going to get a bit weird. No, yeah, they are. They're weird. They're not <laughs> like full on Twin Peaks, there's a Red Lodge kind of weird. 
But it was, but, hmm. <laughs> it was a sweltering July that year. It was so hot. Everyone is getting ready to make plans for the Independence Day weekend. So people in Troy, they're going to go off to the lakes. They're going to go and have a lovely weekend for the 4th of July. Now, Hazel had been talking for a little while about that she was going to take a trip to Lake George with her aunt and some friends. The night before she was due to go away, on the Friday of the Independence Day weekend, she goes to a dressmaker orders a new shirt and a very heavy specific black skirt that she needs for the weekend. She needs this for her trip. Now, this skirt is triple layers of black. Yeah, not ideal for a hot hot evening. No, no. The dressmaker's like, is there a funeral that I don't Mm. know about? And don't you want a nice light summer dress and, you know, to go with your lovely white shirt? No, 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 no. She insists that she doesn't want the, the summer dress. She wants this skirt. She needs to look her best for this weekend. She's also borrowed money from her mother that day in order to pay for this outfit. Hazel had her own money, but and she also had been planning this trip for ages, but then suddenly on the Friday, there's this rush to have this finery. Dressmaker says, okay, it does it, it creates it. Obviously had nothing better to do that day. <laughs> Someone was like, what, what did she, she go so that fast? Could well, she? Had char- no... Charge double for a rush job. Exactly, yeah. <laughs> Collects the dress. Hazel does not leave town that weekend. The trip that she had spoken of does not transpire. Whether it was cancelled or whatever reason, she doesn't go away. She doesn't go away to Lake George. On the 6th of July, Monday, Hazel wakes up in her live-in job, goes downstairs and quits. Okay. Very pleasantly, sort of sleepily, the mistress of the house is standing going, oh, would you mind doing some laundry? Not her job. So Hazel goes, fuck off. No, she doesn't. She just says, I... Just don't want to work for you anymore. Thank you very much. I'm going to leave now. And the the mistress of the house is thrown. Like, did we do anything? Is are you, are you, uh, Okay, I guess. And here's your wages. In a good mood, Hazel packs up her bags. She packs a suitcase. She packs all of her items into her trunk. She sends the trunk off to her parents' house. Now, her parents have since moved away from William Taylor, Uncle William Taylor's farm. They have a house nearer to Troy. She sends her trunk to be delivered there, it arrives that day. She leaves with her purse and her suitcase out the door very merrily. Heads over to Aunt Minnie's house. Says to Aunt Minnie she's going to go and visit some friends for a couple of days. Uh, just wanted to say goodbye, I'll see you when she gets back. Doesn't mention she's quit her job. And Aunt Minnie, like, okay, Fine. bye-bye. On the Monday, Hazel is not seen for the rest of the day. No one knows where she goes that night. And the next morning, she is seen at Troy's Union Station checking her suitcase in to storage. (laughs) So she's storing her suitcase there, bit away, somewhere, Monday night, no idea where. And then for the rest of that day, she is not seen until the evening, when she is seen by several people walking along Taberton Road near Sand Lake. So she's out of Troy. She is now walking along this pretty remote road that leads up from Sand Lake, the town, into the wilderness. Now, geographically, I have to sort of paint a picture here. <laughs> it is a remote area. Her uncle's farm is in this area. Potentially, she's come out and she is walking up this track and will wend her way up to her uncle's farm. But it's also, this is like a dirt track road. This isn't a main road. There will be people passing by who will see her. But it is not a place where a woman should be walking alone in the evening. It's July, it's light still. But she is walking along. She is wearing her black skirt, the new black skirt. She's wearing her white blouse. She's carrying her big black hat with three huge plumes in it. Nice. Yes. Dressed, dressed, impressed. Lovely boots, new boots, just walking along very, very happily, very happily. Now, this dirt track leads up. It will come around the corner to a place called Teal's Pond. And then it also goes up into the wilderness. In this area, you've got, as I said, Uncle Taylor's cabin up there. You have a hotel in the other direction before you get to Sand Lake. You also have another single track that leads up to a place called Alps Camp. We're going to come back to that place. Either way, it's enough that people are going when they pass her. What is this woman walking along this road for? It's not normal. No, it's it's also a place where like the lumberjacks and the wilderness men and the charcoal burners around there will use this road to go and get drunk in Sand Lake and walk back. A lady alone. No, 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 no. They see her dressed up. A husband and wife called Mr. and Mrs. Rowland, who are taking their little carriage across the fields, see Hazel around 7, 7.30 p.m. And they see her picking raspberries. 
on the side of the road. Marvellous. <laughs> yes, there it is. Lot of raspberries, raspberries lots of raspberries, raspberries bushes. And again, I, I saw this referenced once and I thought, oh God, this is just hyperbole. But actually it becomes very, yeah, it's like Ex- everyone's like, she was picking ra- raspberries, was she picking? And yes, and there is an exchange as well with the husband and wife. They look at her and they see her picking raspberries and the wife goes, ooh, she's pretty. And Mr. Rollerman says, ah, oh, yes, she's pretty, but she's a fool to be on this road alone. It also sounds like it's him going, that would be a real shame if something happened to her, wouldn't it? <laughs> oh, she's pretty. <laughs> I want her face. <laughs> To hang upon the wall. If you love me, you give me her face. <laughs> well, as they're riding away, uh, Mr. Rollerman is still looking back going, my, but that girl is having a good time with those berries. <laughs> it does seem like he's just looking back at the pretty girl going, just got to make absolutely sure she's picking those berries. Just one last look at the hot blonde. Yeah. Some reports have it that the wife says that. <laughs> They're both <laughs> commenting on her berries a lot. Okay. This is weirdly important because these raspberries that she's seen to be picking, she will never eat. Okay. Perhaps they're a gift. Perhaps. She was then seen by a farmhand who lived in Sand Lake called Frank Smith and another man, Rudy, who was a charcoal burner of the area. Now, those men had been working in the area. Frank knew Hazel. He had known her in her youth and he was acquainted with William Taylor. Frank Smith is repeatedly referred to as a half-wit. Nice. Mm. So, not the brightest bulb in the shop, uh, but whatever they want to say about it. But he's travelling with his car and they're just reaching a point that some people call the hollow. Actually, it was called Piss Hollow. Lovely. Yeah, 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 yeah. But Piss Hollow is this sort of turning point and that's where Teal's Pond is. Uh, And a pond is just, it's a pond. It's just a big bit of water. Thanks for that. No, but it's a big one. It's not like a little one with a duck house in it, you know. Not like a British one. Oh my God, it's a singular goldfish. A singular goldfish that's dead. It's been choking itself like, I hate it here. One swan and a huge carp. (laughs) Now, they slow down and Frank calls out to Hazel. Whether he calls and stops to her, he certainly calls her at some point because the reports differ, but... He says hello to her and says, do you want a lift? Can, can, can we give you a ride somewhere? And Hazel says, no, 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 thank you very much. I'm just happy walking, happy walking along. And they ride away. Frank and Rudy are the last people to see Hazel alive. Mm. Four days later. Ooh, okay. 11th of July. Three young men have been camping in the area. They have been fishing. They have been hunting. They've been working. And they're packing up from their last night and they are walking down Taberton Road and they're walking through the wilderness past Teal's Pond. A man named Lorenzo Gruber looks out over the water and he spots a black mass floating there and he thinks is this a bit of fabric is this what what the hell is that then he sees arms and hair they run down and they see it is the body of a young woman her fancy hat and her gloves are in a neat little pile a little distance away from the pond She's pulled out of the water. Now, the body is almost unrecognisable by this stage. It has been in the water for several days. Yeah, not going to be pretty. It really isn't. No, no, no. It's completely bloated. Uh, The eyes are loose. It's it's sort of the the skin colour is turning. It, it, it it's not great. It's not great. The police are called and other men in the area come to help, including Frank Smith, the one who saw her on the road. Yes. He's working in the area. He comes down and helps to pull the body out. Doesn't say anything Ooh, okay. anyone. No. Now, at first, the authorities on the scene, a doctor who is called, they go, it must be an accident. She's fallen into the pond. She is, uh, yeah, she, she's taken her own life or she slipped and fell. That's all it is. As gruesome as the body is, they quickly realize, okay, this isn't suicide. This isn't an accident. She's got blunt force trauma to the back oh, of yeah, her head. Very much not an accident. Yeah, one blow to the back of her head. Uh, much is made as well. She was wearing maybe a ribbon around her neck, probably that she'd put for decoration. And it is very, very tight now because of the bloating of the corpse. Though one doctor surmises that she had been strangled and then struck on the back of the neck. They thought the ribbon showed that she had been strangled. Whereas other doctors said that she was just wearing a ribbon and it was bloating. This is just coincidence. When she's taken away... As they examine her, they don't reveal any evidence of sexual assault or sexual activity. Body is in that state, but they, they seem fairly certain. So what on earth has happened to this woman? And what of the raspberries? And what of the raspberries? What of the raspberries? No traces of raspberries in her stomach. <laughs> Whatever found. They were in the hat. The hat was covering the raspberry stash. Identifying her is not easy. Not, not, not easy. Not, not so great. 
Not only because of the state of her, no one has reported her missing. Popular young woman, but she's quit her job. She has left town. And she said, I'm going away for a few days. So no one said anything. It's not until a description of her as best as it can be is put in the local papers on Sunday the 12th of July that her father comes forward and suspects this could be Hazel. He formally identifies her from her clothing, from her gold fillings. Also, the dressmaker who helped make her outfit brings some remnants of material with them and goes, this, yeah, this is Hazel, because it matches. Because it's like, it's, the body's not in a good shape. It was remarked on that Daddy did not show much grief at all. Well, he doesn't seem to be the most emotional man. No. At all. So. Not, not the most emotional of men. Uh, maybe it's shock. Mother's the same. Doesn't really show any grief. But the parents know next to nothing about Hazel. They can't give any details about her friends, about what she was doing. They didn't know that she'd quit her job. They barely even knew about her job. Where she was going, nothing. They cannot answer really any questions about her and they just seem a bit blank. The police now have a name, but they're even more flummoxed. A girl with a decent job who has cheerily quit it, disappeared for a night, then wanders down a spooky road before being murdered. Okay... Well, maybe it's just a, a terrible accident or that she met someone on the road and oh, these t terrible, unfortunate things happen. Was she waiting to meet someone? Was she heading somewhere? Was someone with her on the road who was hiding in the bushes? Maybe. Maybe. The old raspberry picking? Covering, uh, covering up for the fact that she was accompanied by a young man? A young woman and a young man should not be walking out together? In that day and age? I think you could walk down the road with someone. Yeah. Could you, really? Yeah, I think so. Wasn't your husband? Well, she's Alone? Not, she's not married. No, that's the point. No, that's the point. So she, I think, yeah, you can walk down the road with someone. Not unaccompanied, not without a chaperone. Oh, I don't know. I think that that is the point that's made, is that she's a young woman. She's walking, stepping out in the middle of nowhere with a young the man. The location is certainly questionable. Yeah, so maybe someone would hide. It's one of the theories on there. The police talk to Aunt Minnie. Minnie's not particularly forthcoming with information. Okay. Just says Hazel saw her Monday morning, said she didn't know anything about her friends. She has no information about her friends, where she might be going. Doesn't know anything. Doesn't know anything. Not helpful, Minnie. Uncle William Taylor questioned. Grumpy as ever. Shows no emotion about the fact that his niece has been killed. Says that even though his cabin is right next to where she was walking, he wasn't expecting her. She never came here. He didn't know she was coming. Doesn't know anything. Not interested. Not the most helpful of families. No, it's all a bit weird. Mm -hmm. More witness statements come in. Now, some of these are probably convoluted over the time with some people going, oh, I definitely saw something. You have the owner of Crates Hotel, which is down uh, towards Sand Lake. He was up and about about 2 a.m. He said he saw a fast moving cart pass by with two men and two women in it. And then it came back with two men and one woman in it. Doesn't know who they were. But it was strange. Okay. Another man, William Huffy, says on the night of the murder, he was passing down that road, didn't see Hazel, but did pass Teal's Pond and saw a man on the spot on the other side of Teal's Pond where her belongings were found and another man in a carriage alone just up the road. And he just noticed these people there. And it was like, okay, but no sign of Hazel. So what the hell is going what on? What the hell is going on? The police start to look more closely at Frank Smith. Now, Frank Smith yep. has not done himself no favours. No. For he is the last person to see her alive. He is there when she's found. Yet he says nothing to the police about having seen her the night before. He doesn't even mention at the scene that he thinks it's Hazel. Yeah, that's, that's definitely dodge. Yeah. He keeps this information back for several days until he reveals that he did think it was Hazel and then he talks to the police. It was said that he had a crush on Hazel and the night he saw her on the road, after he'd seen her, he went drinking at the Crates Hotel. He was down there and apparently was asking all and sundry if Hazel was staying in the area. Was she staying somewhere? Could he go and call on her? Now, remember, Frank is not a very bright man. Yes. He's asking all these questions. He knows her uncle, though. He knows William Taylor. So he could have just gone up to William Taylor's house and knocked on the door with a bunch of posies and gone, hello. But no. Later that night, around 11 p.m., he's seen trying to break into the local pharmacy. Oh. And someone stops him and is like, what are you doing? And he's like, I just need to get into the pharmacy. Why? Why? Someone said, one source said in his youth he was rumoured to torture animals, but there's no information on that whatsoever. Yeah. So someone just going, oh, I uh, yeah. reckon, uh, yeah, I he was reckon. To torture animals. Now, it's maybe thought that Frank hadn't said anything because he was afraid. In his oh, ignorance, yeah. he, he thought, if I say I saw her, they're all going to lynch me. Yeah. 
they're going to accuse me of murdering her. And he was terrified. Maybe he was just excited to see her, hope to call on her. It was all innocent. And whatever the pharmacy was, maybe he was after drugs or some sweets. I don't know. Maybe he had killed her. Maybe as the police try and pin on him, it was a terrible accident that he covered up for one interrogation they had with him they tried to get him to admit that him and rudy in the carriage had hit hazel with the carriage and she'd hit her head and that had killed right. her so then they thrown her in the pond like an accident or something one accident to cover another but then there's no evidence of her sustaining any other injuries if you've been hit by a car uh, you're gonna be gravel and some bruises and scratches all over the place exactly did he accost her she jumped back whacked her head mm. maybe maybe but he denies any wrongdoing and they cannot build a case against him. There's Uncle William up in the mountains. Ah, oh, he's always very shifty, very vague. Everyone says, oh, he's weird. He's weird. Really, everyone oh, definitely says he's weird. They call him suicidal and melancholy. Oh, good. Nice. He'd been married, had six kids, five of which died in a 15-year period. Okay. Now, we all know that kids die. Yeah, but that's Harsh conditions. Uh, it's a lot. It doesn't take long for people to start going, maybe something happened to them. Was Hazel going up to see her uncle? It's a bit of a coincidence. It does seem a coincidence, but then why would she? And in all her finery, without a suitcase, was she going up to pay a visit? And what reason would he have oh, to man. kill her? Did he kill her, take a direct route down to the pond, which he had, and dump her body? He was alone in the cabin that night. The people who worked at his farm were out. Her brother and sister, Lord, who stayed with him, they were not there. So he had no alibi. But again, what evidence did the police have? Maybe this is, as we said, all just a tragic accident. Until oh. they open Hazel's trunk and suitcase. And it transpires Hazel may not be the person they thought she was. Ooh. And I think that's time for a drink. Marvellous. Well, Nick. Yes? We have a brutally murdered girl. We do. But now things are going to get a little bit more Twin Peaks. Excellent. The police find Hazel's suitcase at Union Station. And they find it's only got enough clothes for one night. So she'd taken an overnight trip. Okay, fair enough. Where to? We don't know. But in it... They find a silk robe. Ooh. Now, much is made of this silk robe because young, respectable ladies don't wear silk robes. They're expensive and they're the sort of thing that you use for your, you know, your, your man <laughs> to impress a gentleman caller, perhaps. Yeah, they really go to town on this silk robe. What was a young church-going girl doing with a silk robe in her overnight bag? Hazel's trunk that she packed up from her previous employer's residence had arrived in her parents' house on Monday the 6th of July. Parents had not touched it, nor made any inquiries about why it was there or where their daughter was. <laughs> Brilliant parenting. Yeah. Any sign of my daughter. Nope, 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 nope. So the police open it, and inside they find dozens and dozens of letters. Ooh. Love letters. Ooh. Explicit letters. Exciting. From a lot of different men. Ooh, scandalous. Mm. Copies of her own letters that she sent, she kept them. And then the replies, and they are filled with flirtations, pretty serious declarations of love, and promised meetups. There's letters from one man who signs his missives CES. He is obsessed with her. He writes to her repeatedly, varying between praising her incredible beauty and then accusing her of ignoring him, of betraying him, of all these slights. They're posted from Boston and New York, and that corresponds with when. Hazel went on trips to those places, Ooh. the dates and the location. There's another letter from a man who signed it, Your Knight of the Napkin. Delightful. This letter apologises for the bruises on her arm and for being rough with her. Oh. Mm. Oh, that's not good. Lots of other letters from mystery men. There are detailed instructions of a planned liaison with one admirer that was signed how he hoped to see her or he would die of starvation. Mm. So so not just gentle hello, might I walk no. with you on no. Sunday in the park. This is, this is oh, serious stuff. Okay. Was she supposed to meet with one of these men on the Monday night? Did she go and meet them on the Monday night? And who was she waiting for on the Tuesday? But none of her friends, her employers, her family, knew about these men or about any man in her life. And a young woman 
in her position probably would have mentioned a beau. Someone she was seeing or writing yeah, to. Yeah, these don't sound like boyfriends. Are they boyfriends? This no. level of correspondence that she's keeping that she's not telling anyone about. Would she be telling, oh, I've got a few men have been writing to me. Yeah, Wasn't it fun no, no, and no. it's a lovely flirtation? Mm -mm -mm. One friend manages to reveal that Hazel had a fiancé a couple of years earlier, but it had ended poorly and that was her last serious relationship. That's the last anyone knew. So she's taking these trips alone. No one had ever questioned them. She's keeping the, these letters from infatuated young men. She's a servant as well, not a gentrified young woman. This is all adding up to what kind of double life did Hazel live? The police speak to Aunt Minnie again, and they present with her rumours that her and Hazel had been seen on a carriage ride with several men Scandalous. in the city. Again, not proper for two unwed women to be going on a carriage ride with a bunch of strange men. Minnie doesn't give them any names and tells them it's none of their business. Doesn't need to tell them anything. It's none of their business what she and Hazel did in their spare time. Minnie around this time also writes to one of Hazel's close friends who had been corresponding with her and their letters were found in the trunk. Maybe this friend was the only one who was given hints that Hazel had pen pals, but not to the extent. Minnie asked this friend to burn every correspondence that Hazel had ever sent her. What's going on? <laughs> Do you have theories? I have theories. You have theories. Okay, what's your theory? Well... If you can bear to say it. I can try and say it. I mean, is she some sort of, sort of call girl? Is she... An escort. An escort type thing. Mm. Entertaining these chaps, going for visits and things. Is it just business? It's... One of the theories, had she really just walked into a city like Troy from a family of farmers and gotten a job instantly as a well-paid domestic servant in a prosperous household and then always moved to more prosperous households just on luck? Maybe she did. Maybe, Maybe she, she did. did. Maybe she was so charming and determined and bright that she did get in there. Or was her beauty a way in? Was she working for prominent families? Was her aunt Minnie helping to introduce her to people? Minnie, Minnie's definitely involved. And was she now privy to the secrets, to the private lives of a lot of powerful people in Troy? The winter before her death, she had gone to stay in her uncle's cabin in the woods with a mysterious illness. Oh. Three weeks she spent at her uncle's cabin. No one knew what was wrong with her. The uncle, when questioned about this, when it emerged, he said, I never asked her what was wrong with her and I didn't want to know and I don't know. Don't know. It's like, right, she stayed in your house for three weeks sick and you don't know what was wrong with her. No, sister, her sister-in-law tended to her. Never had a conversation at all. Never had a conversation. She has left town for a very short period of time with an illness and then come back. Would you really go to a cabin in the woods in the winter <laughs> yeah. when you're sick? Was this a pregnancy slash termination? The autopsy didn't reveal any evidence of a pregnancy or an abortion, but also said a receipt. I'm not sure if this is true, but it was said that in her trunk, a receipt for French female pills was found. You wouldn't keep something like that, would you? I don't know. Well, if she needed to. Why would you need to keep the receipt? Because maybe she needed to know, maybe she needed the prescription or the contact if she was taking birth control or oral ways of, uh, of yeah, inducing a miscarriage. Yeah. Now, whether that receipt was found or not is, but a lot of people figure why the hell did she leave town yeah. if she wasn't trying to hide something? If Hazel was really living a double life with these powerful political people, is that why she died? Is that why the investigation really doesn't go anywhere? Mm -hmm. But do you want to hear the weirdest twist in yeah, all do. of this? I do. Which is the most Twin Peaksy bit of it. Okay. And people will start going, oh, I know that venue. You remember I mentioned the Alps camp when yes. I was describing the geography. I said there's yes. a little road that goes up to the Alps camp, but yep. we were going to come back to it. Oh, yes, 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 yes. This place close to Teal's Pond. It was known to be owned by an Albany millionaire, a man named Henry Cramroth. And it was a resort. It was a resort, a very private resort where people could relax, unwind and have orgies. Yep. Yep. It was a place that everyone knew about locally and whispered. It said where purity and virtue were but lightly held. Nice. <laughs> the rumours about this camp had persisted for ages and there were several residents local to the area who had cabins in the area who swore blind that they had seen weird stuff going on. 
there are stories that the camp was run by very wealthy people. Young ladies would be lured up there, taken on a carriage ride by nice men, taken into this camp in the middle of nowhere, and then be asked to do certain things. Mm -hmm. uh, stripped naked, and then wouldn't be given their clothes back until stuff happened. Yeah, that's, that's good. You have got accounts from people who lived in the area saying that they had women running down Tabiton Road, running from this camp, asking for help. Some dressed in just a men's overcoat and pulled on boots, asking to use telephones, trying to call people, explaining that they had been taken and trapped in this camp. They were frightened for their lives. You have people hearing screams coming oh, from this camp. That's not a fun place. No, at night. Is this basically One-Eyed Jacks from Trin yeah. Peaks? Was Hazel heading to that camp? Was she going to be brought up there? Did she meet someone and did things get very out of hand? There was one report that said that Henry Cramrith's glasses were found near Teal's Pond. Oh. His spectacles were found there. He defended himself against the allegations, denied everything. The lead detective in this case, having heard evidence, heard reports from all these people about what happened in that camp, deems it unimportant. I'm sure he does. Yeah. Nope. Yeah. Not touching that with a barge no, pole. Not. That can't possibly have anything to do with this woman's death. This mysterious sex camp <laughs> where slaves are kept. That I'm a member of. <laughs> yes. <laughs> that some very rich and powerful people may have been a member of. Now, is this such the juiciest part of this story? How much of it is true? A lot of people said it was, that's what went on. And that's why they think things really shut down very quickly. The investigation <laughs> ended. There was an inquest that was rushed through. Names that were eventually given by Minnie. Aunt Minnie did give up some of the names of the men that they had ridden out with. They were never recorded. They were never called on. A statement from the police said, after five days of careful investigation, in which many theories have been advanced, a motive for the murder is lacking. Nothing has been learned that would warrant the authorities in making an arrest in connection with the crime. This being the case, the accident theory is advanced. <laughs> the road da, 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 is popular with automobilists. A reckless chauffeur speeding along the night may have struck the girl with his car, causing her death. Rather than face the consequences and knowing the country well, it would have been comparatively simple matter to have taken the girl's body up in the car, up the lonely road towards Taberton, and to have thrown her body into the mill pond. Yes. Yep, nothing to investigate there. <laughs> Just random car death. The inquest two weeks later rushed through. Several witnesses were not called, including the girls who had been found who had run away from Alps camp. The rich owner, Henry, he was brought in to say, no, 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 I never did anything. Yeah, but the people who all said that you did do something weren't brought in. <laughs> and that is the mad thing about this case. So much happening, so much intrigue and so many secrets. No one is ever brought to justice. No one cares. Hazel Too much money. Yeah. And not, not important enough people. Yeah, Hazel Drew's death remains unsolved. The district attorney believed that Hazel had started an affair with a prominent Troy citizen. And this was all a case of a love affair gone sour. They, they, he even had evidence, and there was evidence seemingly mounting in the background to pin it on a dentist from Troy who was either engaged or already married, she had thought a promise had been made. They were going to run away together when he broke it off and he met her in the secret location and said, no, we're not going to get married. She freaked out and so he whacked her over the head and killed her. It's quite possible. Yeah, absolutely. It's quite possible. Decades later, the grandson of this dentist, Fallon, his name was, posed another theory that it wasn't the dentist, the lover who had killed her, but that man's father-in-law prospective father-in-law who was a very very wealthy man and had basically was known for being ruthless and really brutal and that he had organized for hazel to be killed rather than bring his new brother his new son-in-law into scandal right. so there it is the story passed into legend until a child a young mark frost was told stories by his grandmother who lived in the area decades later who told him of a young woman who was killed in the shadow of the Taberton mountain and that her ghost still haunted the woods so all the boys must get home before dark nice and that woman would turn into laura palmer from twin peaks da, da, 
Da! Marvelous, marvelous. So there you go. That is the story of Hazel Drew. Oh, that's a good story. Yes, heavily inspired Laura Palmer. Yes, there's lots of other elements that were that influenced Twin Peaks. Certainly David Lynch's various ideas and everything, and, and other cases as well. But this is a big one, and this is what fascinates people about it. So I'll, I'll give you a summary of what we know and what we think okay. before you weigh in croakily, croakily. with your views. Yeah. Hazel uh, quit her job in her finery. Sent off a trunk, had a suitcase overnight, spent the night somewhere, and then ends up on this road, uh, Taberton Road, on the Tuesday. Walking along the road leads up to her uncle's house. Walking along a road that also leads to the Alts camp. Walking alone, but ostensibly, could have been involved in a terrible accident, could have fallen down and knocked her head. Could have been accosted by someone, fallen down, knocked her head, or had received a blow to the back of the head. Was her special dress some sort of commission from a lover? A very particular outfit that someone wanted to see? There was no blood by the pond, so no evidence of blood spatter after she'd been struck in the head. So was she killed elsewhere and moved there? Was she killed by hired hands on behalf of someone else? Da, da, da. What are your thoughts, Nick? I think it's unlikely to be a, ra- a random act. Yeah. Well, I think if it's just like, oh, they met someone on the road who was drunk and he, someone tried it on and then the authorities... A drunken lumberjack. A drunken lumberjack or something. Yeah, came across the, the woman walking alone, tried something on, she rebuffed him, whack over the head in the pond. Because if it's something like that, then the, the authorities are going to pay attention. Yeah. And are going to make an effort to find out what's what. What's interesting is the speed at which they're going, oh, we don't know. Mm. So, which may, makes you think that there's, there's pressure from on high somewhere. Yeah. To sort of, yeah, this needs to go away. This needs to go away um, very quickly. Yeah. So, yeah, is it, was she involved with someone she shouldn't have been involved with, a married senior figure, or is, mm. it, this, is it this sex camp? <laughs> <laughs> the sex camp. <laughs> it certainly seems that yeah, there is pressure to just brush the whole thing under the carpet. Yeah, it does. It does seem like that. And, you know, while she's a servant, you know, she's she's a pretty blonde white woman. It's all over the press and it's yeah. reported on for, for weeks and months. And, and the press get very annoyed by it and they throw out all sorts of theories. I'm I'm on the side of something shady was going yeah. on. I don't think it was an accident. The fact that she was walking along there and she, did, you know, everyone said who saw her that she was quite happy, quite swinging a hat, wandering along, not a care in the world, no fear. Not determined to get somewhere. Uh, maybe she knew the area. If, well, if she, her I uncle's she, cabin. Yeah, she must have grew. She obviously grew up around there, so yeah, she, she, she must have known the area. Mm. And she obviously must have had a destination in mind. And was um, she she in a good mood because she was going to meet her beloved? She was going to meet someone, or she was going just going to a job. She was going to get paid. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> going to get a lot of money and was in her finery. Yeah, well, yeah, you always know, you say she's great. Meet, meet, meeting um, Louis, meeting a lover. So, in, if if it was a lover, I think it with the. If it was just a sort of a a man who was slightly above her class, in in you know she's what working class d- trying to climb into middle class. If it was someone middle class, I guess then, I, I mean, it seems far fetched for him to kill her. But other cases we've covered yeah, plenty well, of other absolutely. cases where that's happened. It just seems strange with all the letters. The strangest of Aunt Minnie as well. Aunt Minnie knew something. Aunt Minnie. I mean, I I've got this vision of Aunt Minnie being some sort of like brothel madam. Yeah. Type of thing. Ar- ar- arranging these, yeah. these rendezvous and these these appointments. Mm. Aunt Minnie um, knowing that her niece is young, pretty, take, taking a cut off the back or something. Oh, yeah, and and saying you know if you if you step out with these gentlemen as an escort rather than just you know straight sort of prostitute the yeah, brothel absolutely. and everything, no, which, with, just, of which there were many in Troy. A, a, yeah, and a companion for the evening. Yeah, if something happens. Happens. If something if happens, then darling, it doesn't, sort of you're a young um, lady and you'll be very yeah. well paid. It does seem like that may have been going on. But then what, what happens, it's it's easy to imagine that she had made some sort of bond with someone powerful and rich, maybe as part of her duties or just mm. and she foolishly thought, yes, this is going to be... Well, she obviously thought she was set. She quit her job. Quit her job, she, she was out. She thought, well, I don't need to work anymore. Mm. Or I don't, I don't need this job. No, because I don't know. My lover, he's going to marry me. He's going to mm. propose or something. I'm, I'm set. I don't need, I don't. We're going to run this away work. together. Yeah. We're going to run away together, or I'm going to get, I'm going to get married or whatever. Which is why she's so happy and jolly and stuff. it doesn't work out like that. It doesn't work out. I think it's 
if that if she'd quit her job and then gone straight to Taberton Road and died, is the fact that she disappears on the Monday night. She travels somewhere with her overnight bag, has some sort of liaison, comes back and then is jodily walking on the road. So it's sort of why would she go out of town and then meet there? And it's just a bit strange. Well, or yeah. it's it's the sex camp. Sex camp. The yep. big scary sex camp. Yep, come here. I've got you a silk dressing gown. <laughs> yeah. Then, and then I'll meet you at the sex camp. Sex yeah. tomorrow. It's a sex camp up there where lots of probably very wealthy men went up and, and partook of some abducted women and did terrible, terrible things. Yeah. yeah there's, while some of the reports in some of the sources are quite vague, there's one documentary and a filmmaker and lots of people who researched it uh, did, did uncover several accounts from residents and the girls as well saying, no, 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 they, there were plenty of people who said, no, this happened. The, these women have run oh, down yeah. from this camp, turned up on my doorstep, half naked, trying to make a phone call saying, I've been abducted. She's tr- trying to cover their shame, but still, and yet never called up and never spoken about. And that that does smack of, okay, if this woman died at the pond, we are not going to talk about yeah, it. Absolutely. We're not going to talk about it. Someone got a little bit too handsy. And yes, well, people, what do you think? Who killed Hazel Drew? And who killed Laura Palmer? I mean, we know. But we shouldn't know. That's my point. That's my point about Twin Peaks. We shouldn't know who killed Laura Palmer. It would have been better if we didn't know. Quite. I was spending all last night now just reading back through the synopsis of Twin Peaks after reading this going, oh, it was a good series to a point. Tell us what you think. Jump on the comments of this episode. Tell us your thoughts, your theories. Do you know the area? Have you heard the legends before? What do you think really happened to Hazel? And is there an angle we have not explored? There are some brilliant resources to this story out there. A documentary called Who Killed Hazel Drew by filmmaker John Holzer. A book, Murder at Teal's Pond by David Bushman and Mark Givens um, lots of articles lots of writings about it because of its connections to Twin Peaks so weigh in and also do you love Twin Peaks uh, what did you love about it how would you have ended the series <laughs> what would you have done with it and um, most importantly you must mix up an IVO yes oh you might have to do this bit. <laughs> and it's getting worse, isn't it, Nick? It's getting I mean, worse, this, it's been a brave episode. Yes, the recipe will be out on Friday. Give it a chance if you can. It's it's really nice. Yeah, the raspberries. Everyone loves the shampoo. Always so, have some shampoo. Always in the have house. some shampoo. It's not expensive. It's really good for a, fru- a fruity twang. Um, it's great with just a bit of champagne. Oh yeah, just with, some with sparkling some, wine. some sparkling wine or something lovely. But Zhuzh no, it up. This this worked really well. We both polished ours off. <laughs> yeah, we um, have. <laughs> so, yeah. Let us know what you think. I know this has been a weird episode because you could barely hear Nick in it. And he try- He was trying. God love him. He was trying. Love him. He trying, was trying. So much. I'm trying. He was waving and then there's nothing would come out at points. So uh, it's been a story from me anyway. <laughs> I'll, be, I'll be back soon. <laughs> well, next week it'll be you and I'll just have a little sleep. Go, all of you, and now watch Twin Peaks again. Uh, let's see how, how, how much it's dated. If you haven't already, come and join us on Patreon for more episodes every single week as well as lots of bonus content. And follow us on all the social media channels, Instagram, TikTok, it's fun over there, and whatever else you're doing. Just send us messages. Good stuff. Thanks for listening, guys. We have been the people inside the Poisoner's Cabinet. We will see you next week. And remember, your loved ones are trying to kill you. Bye. Bye.